So when we finished, uh, when we finished Acts, where did, where did we leave Paul? We find him in Rome. Yeah, and I kind of want to start there really quickly. So if you, if you have your Bible, turn to Acts 28. I just want to pick up a few verses here because I think it's really important um, as we continue into the book of Philemon. So, spoiler alert, we'll be moving into Philemon uh, after there. So you can, after we're done here next, move over to Phil the book of Philemon. Um, in Acts 28, I'm going to pick out a couple of verses here uh, and just kind of give you a sense of how we left Paul. But you're right, we left him in Rome. We read about his... his uh, Sea voyage, um, which was filled with horrors. And uh, in verse 17 or 16, it says, And when we came into Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with a soldier who guarded him. Uh, verse 23, When they had appointed a day for him, they came to him at his lodging in greater number. From morning till evening, he expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God, and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. Dropping down to verse 30, and he lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him. Uh, 31, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. So this is where we leave Paul at the end of Acts. He's in Rome. He's under what we would consider house arrest. Um, it sounds like he's, he's providing for himself, it says, at his own expense. Um, and he was able to have people coming. And not only were, were people allowed to come, but he was welcoming them. He was preaching and teaching because that's what Paul does, right? And so who knows the, 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 the totality of his work and his time spent in house arrest uh, in Rome. So as we get into the book of Philemon, and I can't even see that from here. Sorry about that. So just from a timeline standpoint, most likely that... The, 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 the consensus that I've seen is that the book was written, the letter was written around 62 AD. Um, so again, this is the time when Paul is in prison. Uh, he's in Rome, and he writes this letter uh, around 62 AD. And just to give you some context around that, uh, the kind of hypothesized time of his, of his death, up here it says between 64 and 67. So we're talking two to five years before, before he would be killed. Um, so this is some of his later work. And he even references that in Philemon, saying he's, he's an aged man at this point. Um, and we're going to get into, well, we'll save that as we dive into the text here. But um, So that's what we're talking about. From a location standpoint, again, we've probably touched on this in Colossians, but um, we kind of, Colossae in that area, um, is over in kind of what modern-day Turkey, what we would consider that. And if you zoom in a little bit closer, and I say Colossae because Philemon, this is where Philemon is located, okay? And so the letter that comes to him is in this area. Um, Colossae, there is a city called Laodicea, which you're familiar with. Uh, there's another town there called Hierapolis, which is also referenced, and they kind of form this little triangle within this Lycus River Valley. Um, within this area. So uh, one of the other things that's kind of interesting to note is that most likely the letter to the Colossians, the letter to the Ephesians, and Philemon were all delivered, were all written around the same time and delivered on the same voyage um, by the two men we're going to talk about here in just a minute. So that would have all been delivered together. Um, and that is, that is important too as we dive into the letter specifically for Philemon. Uh, so we kind of get into the major players in this, in this letter, um, and, and there are some major players and there are some minor players, and then they're all kind of, they have their own uh, importance. But the ones you're most likely familiar with, if you are familiar with the, the letter to Philemon, we have Paul, again, who's in Rome. We have Onesimus, who is one of the ones delivering this letter, and the other two that I mentioned. Um, and he's also traveling with uh, Tychicus, maybe? I have those names right? I don't know why I looked, at, I looked over here. But I believe that's the other. So there are two people that are delivering these. So Onesimus, interestingly enough, is delivering a letter about himself. And the people in this church would have known him from his past life as well. So there's some interesting context here. And then we have Philemon, who is located um, in, in or around Colossae or in this Lycus Valley, River Valley area. Uh, we know there was a 
a church um, in Laodicea. We, we reference, well, we'll get into the, there, there might have possibly been two churches in Colossae, maybe just one, um, but we'll get into kind of that location and everything. So Philemon, by the way, means one who is kind. Um, and interestingly enough, Onesimus means profitable. Paul even does a little play on that uh, in his letter. So again, Onesimus is delivering this letter. The relationships that we have here, let's look. From, so from Paul to Philemon, does anybody know like how they would have known each other? I mean, Paul greets him warmly in the beginning of this letter, which we're going to read in just a second. Do we know anything about the relationship between Paul and Philemon? So, um, in verse 19 of Philemon, Paul alludes to converting him, uh, to converting Philemon. Probably, this would have happened during Paul's three-year ministry in Ephesus uh, that we read about in Acts 19, which was around AD 52, 50 to 55 timeline. Um, so, probably, because Paul never visited Colossae, by the way. He was never there. He was in Ephesus. Um, preached, several people heard him there, um, and most likely Philemon was one of those who came back with some others to Colossae. Um, Paul to Onesimus. I'll give you a second chance. Anybody know anything about that relationship? Somebody does. I hear some whispers. He did. So another, another convert, uh, convert of Paul's. Yes, he did. Where would that have taken place? In Rome. Yep. Um, and as we get into the, the book of Philemon, you really start to get a sense more of that relationship, right? But yes, Paul converted Onesimus in Rome, thought very highly of Onesimus, um, and then trusted him enough to be one of the two delivering these letters on his behalf. And then we have Onesimus and Philemon. What's that relationship? Master-slave. Yeah. Philemon's the master. Um, most likely a, a, a wealthy man. Um, Onesimus is a slave, and we'll kind of get into that a little bit more as well. Um, Paul refers to him as a bond servant. Um, probably a, probably a, what's referred to as, a, as one of the household slaves. Um, let me read something really quickly about slaves during this time. This is from the Wearsby Bible Commentary. It says, Estimates suggest that there were, 60, there were 60 million slaves in the Roman Empire, men and women who were treated like pieces of merchandise to buy and sell. A familiar proverb was, so many slaves, just so many enemies. The average slave sold for 500 denarii. One denarius was a day's wage uh, for a common labor, while the educated and skilled slaves were priced as high as 50,000 denarii. A master could uh, free a slave, or a slave could buy his freedom if he could raise the money. See examples of that in Acts 22. Uh, if a slave ran away, the master would register the name and description with the officials, and the slave would be on the wanted list. Similar to today, right? If somebody skips bail or whatever that is, you know, and they're out on the run, um, they're on the wanted list. Uh, any free citizen who found a runaway slave could assume custody and even intercede with the owner. The slave was not automatically returned to the owner, nor was he automatically sentenced, sentenced to death. While it is true that some uh, masters were cruel, many of them were reasonable and humane. After all, a slave was an expensive and useful piece of personal property and would cost the owner uh, to lose him. Um, one of the interesting pieces here is it says any free citizen who found a runaway slave could assume custody. I don't know that, that Paul would have fell into, fallen into that category, quite honestly, when you start thinking about why Paul did what he did. But it's interesting that relationship, and depending on his kind of level within that slave-servant hierarchy which existed, um, he, could have been, he could have been trusted to what I'll say call run errands right, for Philemon. He could have been trusted to, here, take this, go take this money, go do this on my behalf. He could have possibly acted on his master's behalf. Um, but again, these were very valuable, at this time, commodities for wealthy people. 
Um, so let's go ahead and dive into, you have your Bibles, or if you want to try and read that. We're going to start, we're just going to read Philemon because it's only 25 verses. And it's rare that you can read a whole book in one class. So let's do that. Um, and we'll have some questions and some follow-up. So beginning in verse 1 of Philemon, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. Grace to you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers, because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Accordingly, though, I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, and yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to me. Uh, to you and to me. Some of your translations may say profitable and unprofitable in that regard. And I'm sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel, but I prefer to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be compulsion, but of your own accord. For this, perhaps, is why he parted from you for a while, that you might have, that you might have him back forever. No longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, receive in him as you would receive in me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it. Say nothing of your owing me, even your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I am hoping that through your prayers I will be graciously given to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you, and so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Um, so, let's talk about a couple of these other people that are mentioned here really quickly, uh, just to continue with some of the context here. At the very beginning, he mentions um, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Aphia and Archippus. Um, it's thought that Aphia was Philemon's wife, and when it comes to Archippus, there's some discrepancy. It might have been his son. It might have been um, someone that took a prominent role within this church. Um, especially one of the people that is mentioned at the end, Epaphras, is thought to have been the one that actually started this church in Colossae. The other thing we learn here is where is this church located? It's in his house, and that was common. That's what you saw um, in this time. It was in Philemon's house. Um, so, and then a couple other people he mentions at the end there. Um, Aristarchus was a traveling companion with Paul at Ephesus. He mentions Demas um, as, as, as being with him at this time. Does anybody know where else we read about Demas? Have we heard that before? He has forsaken. Yes, yeah, so that's, that's after, right? That's in 2 Timothy. Yeah, that's in 2 Timothy. So we know we kind of have a timeline here, but he talks about in uh, 2 Timothy for Demas, in love with the present world, has deserted me. So it's kind of interesting at this time, and he's in prison. He counts Demas as one of those that are kind of faithful to him within this, in this group that he, that he had with him. Um, we know that's not going to happen, or that's going to, that's going to change uh, shortly. So I, I find that kind of interesting. Um, so it's in his house. One of the things I wanted to ask is, this feels like a very private letter. Why does Paul want it, 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 it? But it's addressed also to the to the congregation. Why? 
Because it's written to Philemon. It's written directly to him. It's talking about him in first person, right? He, at no point other than at no point other than the very beginning when he says and to the and to the church at this. That's the only part he addresses. Everything else is as if you were writing to someone you know directly. Why would why would he do that? Yeah, it's not. Yeah, but I think that there's something to it, too, that the congregation would have known Philemon as well, or Onesimus as well. And if this were to happen, right, if he were to be restored to this number, they'd want to know what's going on, right? <laughs> Wait, this guy disappeared, and, and now you're just kind of bringing him back into the fold like nothing happened? So there's some, there's some really interesting things he adds in there. So he's an old man. He doesn't mention it here, but he's, from everything I've read, like, has a hard time with his sight at this point. He mentions Timothy as one of the people with him. Most likely Timothy was actually writing it. Toward, towards the end, he gets in, yes, and says, yes. Um, he says some, he has some, like, I could play the like authority card on you, but I won't. Yeah, it's really kind of interesting. It's, but I kind of am, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I find it really interesting. Um, and, and we're so so. Paul clearly valued Onesimus. Like he says, there's this father-son relationship, right? I mean, that's that's how close he viewed him. Um, Felt responsible for him. Um, what was what was the problem? Because he even says, "Hey, he can still be useful to me." But yet he sends him. He sends him back on this. I mean, what what would have prompted Paul to to do that? He's a valuable servant to him at a time when Paul probably needs all the help he can get. He's, he's a messenger for him. He needs that. He needs people. He needs able-bodied people to travel that he can trust and deliver things. But he's also saying, but he's also one, choosing him to send him back to a place he might not return. And quite honestly, probably, maybe he doesn't want him to return. Like, what would have prompted Paul to do that? Um, well, I'll just leave it at that. It, it, was the right, it was the moral thing to do. What did he have? That's that... That trumps everything else. I agree. Um, what I don't know is if he had a legal obligation to. And sometimes, but that's, that's a dilemma for us sometimes too, where we know what's kind of legally what we have to do, but that might not be exactly what we want to do. We kind of skirt around it, right? So he had the opportunity, if that's the case, to kind of, I mean, this is a big city. This is Rome. 
Um, what are the chances that he just kind of gets lost in the shuffle here and Paul holds on to him? Yep. Yeah. You owe me for what? What do you say? Yeah. He, he, you owe me. I introduced you to Christ, right? Jason? And he's almost, he basically says later, I, I know that you will. I know that you'll come to that, right? It, 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 it's, it's kinda, it speaks to Paul's ability to communicate. Yeah. So he was, he was, it was benefiting both of them. It was a very selfless act for Paul. It was, my two brothers have a problem. I can, I can help bring them back together. And again, it goes back to it was the right thing to do. Everybody knew, that group knew what was the right thing to do, right? It was kind of a no-brainer. Yeah. Um, what? what um, so Onesimus fled to Rome, most populated city in the Roman Empire. How did he connect with Paul? So let me back up before I, well, hold on to that thought that you're getting ready to answer me. Onesimus wronged his master. We don't know exactly what. We know that Paul offers to compensate monetarily if necessary. There's speculation that possibly Onesimus um, ran away and possibly ran away with some money that he may or may not have been charged with, you know, to do something with. Um, but it had not just, it seemed like beyond just the, 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 the value that he had as a slave, he additionally might have taken more with him. Um, and he runs to Rome, possibly thinking, hey, I could just get lost in this big, huge, you know, metropolis. And then he, he stumbles upon Paul? I mean, what are the odds of that? It had to be providence, right? I mean, it had to be. It just we, we read in Acts 28 how Paul was willing to talk to anybody, was continuing to teach and preach, and even under this, this, this house arrest. And somehow Onesimus finds his way to Paul's door. And a relationship grows both between he and Paul and then between Onesimus and Christ. Pretty incredible. He said, I got nothing else. Yeah. Yeah. Um, It's possible, yeah, it's possible. Um, you, it, it's hard to know like what the communication was like then, especially in Rome. It was he in, yeah, you're right, though. He would have, so my understanding is that, um, is that Epaphras um, was in Ephesus when Paul was there, learned the gospel there. Philemon was also in Ephesus. It was Epaphras that then came to Colossae and started um, started the work, started the church there, um, which then happened to be, I believe, in Philemon's home. Um, but yeah, it, it, just the, the fact that he found Paul in this, this large place, it's it just kind of, it, it's, it's really cool how it all comes together and how God works. Um, go ahead. I think it, I, I interpret that as, hey, during this time period where he's under house arrest, that's the chains. Because he's also under guard, right? He's under guard. He's, he's providing for himself at his own expense, but he's under guard. Um, 
I think that's what he refers to as being in chains. Maybe not necessarily the, the, the very first time he's brought there. It could be. Um, could be. Uh, so when you read through this, I mean, what are some of the themes that jump out at you about the, book, the letter of Philemon? What's the first thing that comes to mind? It really, so it really is, um, hold on, I want to come back to that, because I, 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 it, it, it's, it, it's possibly like one of the more explosive letters he's written, and I want to talk about that a little bit more. Um, yeah. His network, right? I mean, that's, that's the thing. Think about somebody in your life that, it, it's almost twofold. You can think of somebody in your life that has wronged you for, you know, forever. Or you've had something between you forever. Um, and then you add the layer of, they, they're, they're a Christian. Now they're a Christian. They weren't before. Now they're a Christian. So there's a whole nother, not only are you being, go ahead. I want to finish, but I, want, I know you've been. And that's what, he, that's what Paul's driving at, exactly. That's, that's exactly where I wanted to go. So a couple of things that I just pulled out, like this idea of reconciliation, right? Um, this, this idea of both between Onesimus and Philemon, um, their relationship with their Lord, um, like the, the ability to forgive. You touched on kind of this unity, this idea of unity that they share now in Christ, this, this, um, this family that they're a part of now, and how it supersedes the master-slave relationship. It almost makes it irrelevant, but, there's, but, it's, but not technically irrelevant. So there has to be something that has to be addressed by Philemon, which is why Paul is writing him, right? You can't just ignore the fact that this relationship existed, this master-slave relationship existed. You can't just cast it away, but you need to understand that it's a whole other ballgame now, and they're all level at the cross at this point. Um, actually, let me go back. Sorry. Um, so one of the things that 
we see a couple places is, is this, this, this Greek word of koinonia, which you've probably heard of before, this idea of having something in common, but even more so, like having fellowship, um, sharing a mutual um, participation. Think of, think of the early church in Acts 2. We read about them being of one mind, giving to each other, mutual, mutually thinking of each other's needs because of the relationship they had in Christ. Uh, that's what we see here. We, re- we see this pop up in a couple different verses. Look at verse 6. Um, verse 6 uh, in the ESV says, And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. Um, the share- so that word sharing there, comes back to the, the, the word, the koinonia word. And then in verse 17, so if you consider me your partner, partner, he comes back and says, you and I have this mutual participation in the Lord too. So if you consider us to be brothers, here's what I'm asking you to do um, based on this new relationship that I'm just telling you you have now, oh, by the way. So it's a lot to process for Philemon. Yeah, I mean, you don't open up your home to a church if you're not invested, right? He says in verse 21, I'm confident of your obedience, you know, knowing that you will do even more than I say. So you'll go beyond even what I say. And I don't think, it is one thing to say Paul's kind of like digging at him. Hey, I don't have to force you, but I'm kind of forcing you, but I'm not. Like, I think he truly believes this about Philemon. I know who you are. I know what kind of man you are. I know what kind of Christian you are. You're going to do the right thing, and knowing you, you'll probably do more. If you want, whether, whether that means kind of dissolving that relationship. Philemon has every right to kind of maintain some level of, of relationship, like some type of working relationship with him if he wants to. Um, but he might choose to set him free. He has that option too. The other thing is if a slave escaped and he got returned, what were, what were the options for the master? You could kill them. I mean, they had that obligation. Again, they were, they were a value, so that didn't always happen or usually happen, but that was within their rights. And Paul's saying, hey, not only take him back and forgive him for running away and possibly stealing from you, but also recognize now that you have this fellowship with him. It's a whole new level of relationship between the two of you. That's, that's, kind of, that's, that's not something I think you just flip a switch and make that transition. Again, think of somebody that you've had a hard time relating to, and, and all of a sudden, not only are you being asked to forgive them, but also kind of bring them in on this, this level playing field when it comes to our, our relationship with Christ. Yeah, we don't, so Paul doesn't get specific. Right? He doesn't say, do this, do this, do this. He says, I know you, you'll do the right thing. 
here's the new relationship you have with him. I'm going to trust you to do the right thing, whatever that means. Maybe I, I can't have this. It's just like a guilty conscience. Yeah. So it's interesting that, again, the, the Colossian letter to the church at Colossae was also delivered at the same time. And again, whether this was the church that met in Philemon's house or another one that would have been very close because it was a smaller-ish city, um, they're also, the Colossians are also um, getting this letter. And Colossians 3 and verse 11 says, Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian and Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you. So you must also forgive. And above all these things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. They would have been both of these letters, right? So they kind of, they have similar concepts. There's no slave and free anymore. Um, we're united under Christ. So just the, the context is really interesting. Um, I wonder which, which if, if they're both letters were delivered to the church, classic, which one got read first, right? What was the order there? Um, they read one and go, oh, that makes sense. Um, so it's really interesting. I meant, we're about to run out of time here. Um, I mentioned like this to be one of the more kind of, you're right, it's not a theology letter, but it's, it's one of the more explosive letters when you think about that slave perspective. Because remember, Paul asks two things. Forgive Onesimus and embrace him as a brother. When you think about the master-slave relationship, this completely upsets the status quo of the Roman social order. Other, other masters in that area that see this happen, this, your slave ran away, he stole from you, you're going to bring him back and possibly like elevate him from where he was or give him his freedom? What, I don't, we don't know what ends up happening, but like this changes the dynamic that's happening here within, uh, within the Roman status, within the Roman social order here. Um, and does Philemon then have the, the, the nerve to kind of buck the system here and say, no, I'm gonna, I, I know where my faith lies and I know what my responsibility is. Still has slaves? I don't know. Yeah, maybe. I don't. Yeah, I don't know how long that practice lasted, especially among among Christians at that point. I don't know, but.
absolutely. Um, as we wrap up here, one of the one of the things I, I came across was that it's the only letter where Paul does not explicitly mention Jesus' death or resurrection, um, and perhaps intentionally, this this isn't necessarily an oversight. He doesn't need to explain the cross with words because he's demonstrating it through his actions right here. Um, He's embodying what the meaning of the cross was. He made himself the place through which Onesimus and Philemon are reconciled to God and to each other. Um, and the fact that Philemon and Onesimus are now brothers in Christ makes that master-slave relationship ir- irrelevant in a lot of ways. Again, there might have been some transactional uh, relationship, but it kind of changed that for them. So. Any, we've got about one minute left. Any thought, last thoughts? Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. That's, a, that's a good point, yeah. This was an opportunity to demonstrate that. That's a great point. Yes. That's, that's what Christianity does in the world. It, it, it is explosive. It should be. It should be different. It should stand out. Um, thank you all. I believe Sunday starting Peacemakers. Anybody know that? I think, if, I, think, I think Sunday is the Peacemakers class in here. If you don't have the book for it, they're back here. There uh, should be some still on the back. Um, tables. Um, Otherwise, on behalf of Scott, who did all the work in this class, um, thank you very much, and we'll, we'll adjourn for now.